It looked like last weekend's San Diego Comic-Con 2023 was going to be a bust. All the major Hollywood studios had pulled out. There was no Hall H panels. There was no big uh, debut of trailers, really, or any of that stuff. It ended up kind of focusing more on, uh, obviously, comic books and action figures and anime and stuff like that. And we just so happened to have a friend of the channel, Aaron Sparrow, at San Diego Comic-Con 2023. And I guess he had the time of his life, the best San Diego Comic-Con you've been to in years? In years. In years. Uh, yeah, all the studios pulled out because of the strikes. Uh, there were no trailers. There were no celebrities. There was no autograph signings. There was uh, no studios there, uh, you know, displaying their wares. And uh, not a single thing of value was lost. Uh, it was actually a really great Comic-Con all around uh, for the vendors, for uh, you know the people that were there, the people that were selling down on the sales floor. Uh, everybody that I talked to was having just the best con, the best financial windfall they've had at a San Diego Comic-Con in years. And it's been going down and going down and going down. Last year, the year before, a lot of people were talking about pulling, you know, I don't know how much longer I'm gonna do this. This, this con is dying. And uh, all it took was uh, Hollywood to take their ball and go home. And all of a sudden, the interest was there for the stuff that was on the floor again. The things that, you know, the show is actually supposed to be about. My goodness. The only person I know of that had a bad time at San Diego, San Diego Comic-Con, I guess, was Tony Isabella. He got all upset about Eric July or something? I don't even think he was there. I think he was just upset from a distance. I think he hurt his own feelings and then uh, and then got uh, just completely lambasted on Twitter for it, where he thought, he thought he was going to get praise. He thought that everyone was going to lift him up on their shoulders. And believe me, that would take a lot of people because that is not a small guy. Uh, they, they were going to lift him up and they were going to celebrate him. And instead, he just got roasted on Twitter until he had to give a, uh, a non-apology and uh, block a bunch of people. Man, I wish these guys would just like be old and senile and hospice care and stop going on to social media and let everyone know that they've lost their minds. But whatever, well, between Isabella. him and Jerry Godway, they're just like idiots. Tony Isabella, you know, likes to, uh, he like you know, as much as he has right in his bio, creator of Black Lightning, and he likes to remind you at every opportunity that he created Black Lightning, he also likes to deny uh, the black artist that drew Black Lightning any credit at all and, and say that he doesn't, uh, you know, he, he didn't contribute at all to the character, uh, which, um, you know, I find, uh, I, I find pretty, uh, pretty scummy. And, uh, you know, here he is going after a black op entrepreneur uh, and businessman. Um, I think uh, I think Tony Isabella has some of that uh, that white liberal uh, racial bias in him. Perhaps I know I've met Eric July. He came on the channel. We did a live stream with him. Just a really nice, honest, like humble kind of guy. I really liked it. So, yeah, you know, I uh, I ran into him at the show. Uh, he was at uh, Gabe El Taib's table um, up uh, towards the the front of the con, and uh, I was walking by and and saw him and uh, Gabe. And I've met Gabe before. I met him at the Nerdrotic meetup. So I said hi to him and then uh, introduced myself to Eric and. And uh, we had a really nice conversation, and I picked up a copy of Isom to check it out. No, nah, he's, he's a really nice guy. So, uh, is, Tony Isabella, go fuck yourself. Stop being a douchebag. But there were a lot of people out there. Obviously, the, the artist alley, it looks like it was pretty nuts. I know you were hanging out with Aaron Lepresti. I think I saw uh, uh, Tucci in there. Uh, there was a couple other people. You were just having a, a meet and greet with everybody? Yeah, apparently, uh, you know, it's like I've been friends with uh, Aaron Lepresti for years. He's always been super kind to me um, from, uh, you know, the first convention I ever went to in the 90s. And I walked by a table and I, I saw a whole uh, bunch of sludge art from uh, from the Ultraverse. And I was like, oh, you know, my br little brother was with me. And I was like, this is Aaron Lepresti art. And, uh, you know, the guy at the table said, well, I hope so. I'm, I'm Aaron Lepresti and introduced <laughs> himself. And I, I bought some stuff from him and just kept going back year after year. And uh, next thing I knew... Um, you know, he was inviting me out to his wife's birthday dinner, at, you know, which happens during con. We, we, uh, Shelly and I have birthdays that are very close. Um, Aaron's always been very warm and very, uh, a very welcoming individual in the comics community. So we've been friends for years. And uh, yeah, hanging out through him, I got to, uh, you know, Billy Tucci came by the table, got to, got to talk to him. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's absolutely great. I think everybody pretty much loves Billy Tucci. Uh, you know, Dan Fraga came by. I got to meet him for the first time. I, I'm pretty sure I've met him. I met him back like in the 90s, but this is the first time. I really got to meet him. And uh, even Dan DiDio came by. I got to talk to Dan for uh, an extended period of time. So, yeah, really interesting, uh, really interesting trip. That that really made my trip was talking to all these old school professionals like Dan Jurgens and, and uh, you know, guys that have been around the block. So, apparently, you told Dan DiDio that I hate him? But no, what the hell are you trying to do to me, man? I don't hate that. Dan DiDio. He's all right. 
I said that uh, you know if he ever wanted to come on uh, come on the show and talk about what he was doing, you know, or, or, or you know the the things that he's doing with Frank Miller and kind of like the challenges that he's facing now as a as a smaller publisher uh, in a very uh, hostile industry. I uh, you know I offered uh, for him to come on the show and he, he laughed and he said, uh, "Wes is that guy in the Philippines? That guy hates me." And, and was cracking up. Uh, I don't hate anybody. It's really not Dan <laughs> Dan Didio. <laughs> What are you talking no, you know, about? I don't like all his decisions, but hey. But you know, yeah. If he could come back to DC Comics, they'd be in a better spot. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, I think Dan is a uh, is a hot dog vendor, and and every uh, you know, you want to what kind of hot dog you want? You want a chili dog? I'm gonna offer you a chili dog. You know, and even if he has a new idea where he's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put I'm gonna, I'm gonna put spam on this hot dog, and then I'm gonna coat it in squeeze cheese and then everybody goes oh i don't like that then they'll go oh you don't like that well we're gonna get rid of that you know we're gonna bring back the classic hot dog we're gonna do something <laughs> like that so you know it's like even if you don't like the ideas that he had i think um i think he was willing to pivot and just my my read on dan as as a person um just from this meeting is that uh he's he's super affable uh he's super gregarious you know he seems like a guy that you would have a pretty good time going out for a drink with um, you know, I can't speak to how it is to, to work under him because I never did, but, uh, just, you know, on a, uh, on a purely personal level, uh, I got a really good vibe off of Dan. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe he will come on the channel someday. Well, obviously the invitation's out there. Aaron wasn't lying. You can absolutely come <laughs> on the channel. I'd love to talk to you about what's going on with Frank Miller and what it's like to work on that publisher as well. As some of the, uh, the not so, so great ideas you did at DC. Yeah. Bask in the in the gaze of your unvarnished hate. <laughs> I don't hate anybody. I'm certainly never rude to anybody on the channel, other no, than Doctor Fatal J, and they deserve it. Right? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Doctor, so you, you met Dan Jerkins. Was he talking about this uh, 30th anniversary of Return of Superman? Yeah, he talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, and, and he was uh, he was glad to be working on it. It's really strange, isn't it, that uh, Dan Jurgens, just an absolute legend in the industry. You know, he wrote so many books that uh, that I love. You know, he was there for some of the biggest moments at DC Comics, like the death of Superman, and um, and and he's just writing like basically backup stories on Superman books now. Like you know, for Philip Kennedy Johnson, and I think Philip Kennedy Johnson's like like a good writer, mm -hmm. but he's not even like an A or B lister. He's like. He's the guy that should be doing back backup stories for Dan Jurgens. It makes no sense. Not that his his action comics is good, but Dan Jurgens should be doing something much bigger than that. It's yeah, insane. No, yeah, Dan should uh, Dan should be getting. Uh, you know, you're handing off uh, crossovers and things like that to to lesser talents, and you got Dan Jurgens in you know in your arsenal, and uh, and you're not using him. It's um it's it's really strange. I don't know why that is. Maybe Dan's too expensive. You know, maybe, uh, maybe. his page rate's too high, and uh, they got to get somebody in there who can take. Twenty-five dollars a page, and, and write some backup that no one will like and won't mean anything, but at least it filled a spot on the shelf. Uh, I can yeah, just say knows? this: I've had my fill of Josh Williamson-led uh, DC Comics events. We've had three of them in, in three years. I think no more Josh Williamson uh, events. Maybe just bring in Dan Jurgens for the event, and he can lead all that stuff, and maybe he can actually write a good comic book that would actually get people excited. You got Dan Jurgens and you got Mark Wade there, and uh, you know you and I have talked about the fact that they got uh, Robert Wade, Venditti. He's doing nothing. Yeah, yeah, Robert Venditti, uh, Mark Wade, uh, Dan Jurgens. You know, any one of these guys could be could be handling a crossover and doing a good job. Mark's doing a really good job on Batman Superman. You and I have talked about that. You know, and the fact that that is uh, that is a book that is not getting nearly as much attention as it should, and it's just because DC, their most of their output is so terrible right now that even the good stuff can't like break out of the muck. Well, Marvel's not even got anything. You see anybody from Marvel you saw, but Cebulski? I saw Cebulski uh, as I was talking to Didio. I saw Cebulski across the way, uh, you know, telling his assistant. To Did pick you flip like a him. little uh, shrimp? Like you're like the guy at the the Japanese bar, uh, Japanese grill place, like throw a shrimp in his mouth? No, you know, I wasn't. Uh, I didn't have my uh, my Benihana hibachi thing uh -oh, going. That's so what I would have done. Any, he didn't have any. You would have caught it too. You know what he was. <laughs> <laughs> He, he cares about food more than he cares that about That dude's always looking for a dumpling or something. <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, so it was, uh, it was really interesting. I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of professionals who, um, he, you know, I, I respect, and uh, I saw some respect, uh, some uh, professionals that, um, you know, if this were 10 years ago, I might have been impressed to meet. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it was, uh, it was really interesting. The shine is worn off. Yeah. I only went two days, um, but it, and, and that was... That was more than enough, but I had uh, I had an absolute blast for the first time in years. It didn't feel like a chore. Did you buy any con exclusives? Well, I know you're the toy guy. You're the toy aficionado here. 
I actually did not buy any con exclusives this year because uh, most of them are available online and I wouldn't have to wait in line and, and deal with all the, the fighting and the, you know, the nonsense that was going on. I just was not feeling it this year. So, uh, you know, most of the exclusives that I wanted, I bought online and uh, I'm, I'm good. I, you know, here's the thing. My, I'm somebody who values my time. And if I got to rush in and fight a bunch of people to get into a line and then wait there for two hours to buy something, I'd rather just pay a guy on eBay uh, an additional 20, 30 bucks to, uh, to ship it to me. You know, let, let him- He can do I, the work for you? Yeah, like, you know what? He made 15 bucks an hour for his time standing in line. That's fine, I'll, I'm happy to pay that. I'm glad that San Diego Comic-Con 2023 ended up being a blast. And you're not the only person I've heard that. There's actually a, a, quite a few articles that kind of back that up. It sounds like a lot of people had a really good time selling their wares. Did you see Sigma Comics? I think uh, HH and the guys were out there, right? Uh, no, I didn't see them. I, I didn't. Uh, you know, just, apparently, there's a lot of people that I missed. I, I missed a lot of friends that were there. Um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't get. To what talk kind to of friends are you if you missed them? What uh, well, you, I, you know what? I went through Artist Alley looking for people, and I saw some people like I saw Brianna Garcia, who I absolutely adore, and uh, uh, but I missed like Agnes Garboska, who you know I always like seeing and talking to. I ran into David Pepos, who's a you know a great guy that uh, I always like talking to. Um, but you know, there's just so many people like my, my friend Katie Lee was there who was, uh, you know, who's a voice actress. Uh, she was on the original Darkwing Duck series as, as Honker. And, uh, if you guys like Dungeons and Dragons, she was Sheila on Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the thief with her little invisibility cloak. Uh, she was there and, uh, I didn't find out till, uh, till, you know, afterwards on Instagram. And I was like, did you see so uh, Austin Creed? No, I didn't run into him. It's tough when you don't have a table. Oh, if, you know, when you don't have a table, like if, if you had a table, like you know, one time you I didn't was, see the new day, you know, that no, guy was there. The, I didn't see the new day. And I love, uh, I love me some, uh, some Austin Creed, some Xavier Woods, you know, he, uh, he, he's got, uh, he's got a copy of Darkwing Duck, the definitively dangerous edition and, uh, both trades that came out from Joe books, you know, that are all signed. And, and there's even like a, a caricature of him in it, uh, as a duck that, uh, that James Labonte drew, you know, playing the trombone. Uh, and if, uh, <laughs> if Joe books hadn't, hadn't canceled us because they wanted to pour that money into, a Pirates of the Caribbean book that they thought was going to outsell us and didn't, uh, you would have gotten him uh, probably around uh, around issue nine. You would have gotten him as Goslin's music teacher. So, you know, we were going to put Austin Creed in the book because he was such a fan. And You're going to put us. Xavier Woods as a duck in the book, or was he going to be here? Yep, he was going to be a duck. He was going to be a duck and, and Goslin's music with an teacher. With an afro? You know, with the, yep, with an afro. Oh, man, that would have been awesome. <laughs> Were you so, going to yeah, go Chief Regler? Like, when I created the first duck with an afro, I feel like I could accomplish something today. Uh, right. You know, I'm internationally known. My books have been printed in <laughs> Germany. So, uh, you know. <laughs> this, this is the last thing I want to talk to you about, Aaron. I know you've done some writing and stuff in Hollywood, more animation than uh, like movies and screenplays or whatever. But we've got the, the, the actor strike. We've got the writer strike going on. I made a video and people got mad at me because I was like, you know, from my end, I'm not seeing a whole lot of things change. And I don't imagine I'm going to be missing much while I'm watching Home Improvement and Succession. And a bunch of other stuff that's already been made that I that I haven't seen or am watching again. Uh, people thought I was an asshole. Am I an asshole, Laird? Well, you know, you're not allowed to say that, Wes, because you have to support the union. You have to be pro-union, even if uh, even if you don't think that uh, necessarily all of the things that they're asking for are uh, are reasonable. Um, you know, here's the thing: is I'm on the animation side, which is different than uh, the WGA. They're two separate entities. They probably shouldn't be, but they are. Uh, animation writers are paid far less than uh, you know live action writers, oh, even though bullshit. I would say that the work is a lot more intensive. You have to put in a lot more direction, a lot more things going on in an animation script, I think. Uh, but, you know, I'm not unsympathetic to obviously, uh, you know, people wanting to be paid better and people wanting to, uh, you know, have better benefits and do better for their families. I think the problem that you're up against right now is, uh, you know, and what you stated is that you're, you're kind of representing the viewpoint of most people which is you may have sympathy for the idea that, oh, they're not getting paid enough. And then you find out that they get paid four to $8,000 a week to work on, you know, a TV show. And, uh, you know, even after you pay your agent, even after you pay your, you know, your accountant or whatever, you know, you're still making far more than your average person. Uh, and then you find out that like, well, the complaint is that, you know, we only work on a show for like six weeks and, you know, we can't, we can't get benefits. We don't have benefits and we don't, and it's like, well, you're a part-time employee. That's the way it works. Like you have to have full time employment to get some of these things. And so the choice, you know, obviously the choice is what do you need out of life? And therefore, if they're not providing it, you need to make another decision is, is largely, uh, you know, the way that I think most people, most working class people kind of see it because they're working full time. And, uh, you know, six weeks 
let's say you all, let's say you make on the low end, you only get $5,000 a week. You've still made $30,000 over the course of six weeks. That's more than a lot of people make in a year, you know? So it's really tough to have people be sympathetic to this when, uh, you know, the, they see the amount that's being paid to sit in a room and write television and write television that admittedly lately hasn't been very good. You know, that's going to be the viewpoint of your average person. So I uh, feel I like that, when the government does a shutdown, they're like, we need to get back to work. And I'm like, are you sure about that? Because yeah. from where I'm sitting, you might not need to get back to work. I think things will be fine without you. No, I that's love how I'm kind of feeling about the, the writers and the actors. Like, do you really need to get back to work? I mean, I'm not being affected. I mean, I, I do feel for you. And if, if you uh, you want to work on your, your residuals and your digital likeness rights and all that stuff, and I say, absolutely, you should get that down on paper. No, it's tough because, you know, these and, you know, when you think of like the actors and the writers and things like that, I, I tend to think more of the crew, uh, you know, the, well, the, absolutely. Painters, the, you know, the guys know. working in the background, the cameramen, the painters, the people that are setting up and the everything. They're all you know, affected all the, by that, but they're not in the WGA or the SAG after. They're not going to get better benefits because of this strike. They're just getting hosed. Yeah, they're not getting better benefits. They're not getting better working hours, better conditions, you know. Um, so it's uh, it's tough, you know. It's like I feel for all those guys, and I, and I feel for your low end writers. You know, obviously I'm a writer, and I'd like to be paid, uh, you know, what I feel like I'm worth. But I also know that I have to be worth that. I have to bring my A game, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, what you're going to run into, and what you always run into when you have like kind of a union, is that, you know, you elevate the lowest people to a certain level, but it also caps what the highest people can make. So your best people, your achievers, are always kind of like brought down to be more in, in you know, this, this kind of morass with the people that are at the bottom and who maybe aren't so good. And, uh, you know, I wish that there was a way to both have collective bargaining and also, you know, so that you can get the best deal possible out of these studios. Because believe me, I have no love of the studio system, no love of publishers, you know, even in the comics industry, uh, you know, no love of, the, of any of those uh, those fat cats that, uh, you know, buy multiple cars and, and go off on multiple vacations while, uh, you know, you're uh, you're crowdfunding uh, some bridge work. <laughs> you know, for your, uh, no, no, don't get me wrong. Thing. I'm not I'm, I'm not like pro Bob Iger and all this thing. I'm just anti all of it. Like, whatever. I'm pro I'm pro union. I, I do support unions like the coal miners union. But they're like, you know what? 33% of our members have black lung. Uh, could you do something about that? Maybe we need safer working environments or maybe uh, new equipment in there so people die less. And then I go, yeah, that seems like it's pretty appropriate here. But I, I just don't feel like, uh, you know, movie sets and writing scripts is, is nearly as dangerous as what I think a, a, a union is normally supposed to be for. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand what you're saying, Wes. It's you know, it's it's those things that are that are you know complicated. It's uh, you know, you want. Uh, I don't think the teachers' union are, has helped anybody. I think it's well, made everyone helped, dumber. They've helped the teachers' union. I can tell you that they've destroyed California. Uh, so yeah, yeah it's uh, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, I think that um, you know, like any other organization, any other group of people, uh, you know, you may start out with the best intentions, but eventually corruption sets in. The road to hell is paved. <laughs> with those intentions yeah exactly so you know like i said i i think that uh, you know people get mad at you because they kind of are just looking at it as a surface level and they're not going in and they're not digging into all the different things i mean you know th certainly there's things to be concerned about you know i think the actors have a valid concern they should not go in and get their face scanned on their first day and get paid for a day's yeah. work and then the studio gets to use their likeness to do whatever they want with for the rest of their lives that's ridiculous uh, and i think that does need to be fought about fought against uh the writers fight against ai while i understand it i also tend to think of like well you know, technology progresses and it eliminates jobs. And you guys weren't, you know, going out there and protesting when people in the Rust Belt were losing their jobs, you know, to technology or we were shipping, you know, jobs overseas. So it is tough to get normal people on board to care about a bunch of uh, people that they see as spoiled elitists, you know, crying about the fact that they're not getting enough money. Sitting in an empty chamber, yeah. mocking normal people every day. Yeah, you know, maybe if you guys hadn't turned so savagely on your audience, you'd have more support for this strike. And that's always what I'm uh, what I'm advocating for, is I'm always advocating for any time you're an entertainer, you're producing entertainment, you're asking people to pay for it, you're in the customer service business, and you need to remember who your customers are because they are the most important people. You know, you want the studios to pay you mo more money, you know, they, then you need to be pleasing the customer and so that the customer spends their money. All these franchises that are billion-dollar franchises, the reason they're billion-dollar franchises 
is because of the fans that put money into them, the fans that buy the merch, the fans that are excited about it. You keep them excited, you keep them on your side, and uh, you know, you'd be doing a lot better in the course of this strike because they would see you as something valuable as opposed to something they can get by without. Absolutely, and the good news is it doesn't appear to have uh, affected the enthusiasm for San Diego Comic-Con 2023. I think everyone thought maybe it would be bad, but it turned out it was the best thing that could have happened. Everybody made more money, I think. Uh, you know, everybody I talked to was doing great. Uh, you know, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a split of focus. Everybody was focused on you know what was being presented on the floor, and uh, I think it was uh, it was better all around. And I I know that they won't because the San Diego Comic Con board loves hobnobbing with Hollywood. Uh, it makes them feel like they're somebody. Uh, so I don't expect it to change when the strike is over, but uh, damn, it should. Love it when we can get Aaron onto the show and talk about his perspective. Glad he was able to go out to San Diego Comic Con and give a little report. Now, if you're at the end of the video and you're like, God dang it, Wes. I needed some more thinking critical today. It turns out YouTube has algorithms running in the background with what I've created and what you'd like to watch. And they've decided this is the best video I ever created my entire life just for you. You should check it out right now.